if we did so. We should be alive across the universe, the metaverse, the series of tubes that we call the internet. It is Wednesday, April 27th, and uh, glad to have you all here with us. And I'm excited to have uh, somebody. I, I, I've known her for a little bit. Uh, she's actually upstairs right now. For those of you who know, this is Dr. Shelby Reinstein, a board-certified ophthalmologist and uh, also my, my better half. And we happen to be uh, uh, dual broadcasting from uh, downstairs and upstairs. So as you all know, as we, we often joke, um, I ask you where you are logging in from, from around the country, or around the world. And uh, I think I can answer for both of us. We are logging in as I look out my window outside from fairly sunny Pennsylvania. I'm excited. It's a little bit on the chillier side today um, as uh, you know, wearing our sweaters and sweatshirt, but uh, we're starting to get some of that spring and summer weather in. And we already have, and you can tell we have our, our favorites and our, our originals that are here with us because many of you know the drill and you've already started typing in where you are logging in from. So we have uh, Cynthia, uh, we have uh, let's see Elaine from North Carolina, we have Tennessee, Trish from Tennessee, Pamela from California. Uh, we have somebody from, let's see, the Pacific Northwest, Diane. Welcome, Diane. Uh, Carolyn from South Florida. So you all know the drill. Please go ahead and type in where you are logging in from around the country or around the world. We absolutely love seeing. We have our friends from Portugal that always log in, log in and uh, 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 the United Kingdom and uh, Kim from Calgary, Alberta. So North America, but we're getting there. We have, let's see, uh, Florida. Uh, now they're Fast and the Furious, California, go. Wisconsin, go Bucks, says Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, go Please type in where you are, are logging in from. We just love it. I mean, it is uh, 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 truly very exciting for us to check in and see where you all are logging in from. And oh, Finger you, Lakes. Oh, Finger Lakes. Excellent. We had a great experience. The oh, awesome wineries. Some good wine country and some good cheese. Uh, really excited. Uh, uh, the Miranda Cheese Company giving them a little shout out plug from personal experience, right? That was Shelby. That was the name. Yeah. Of yeah. Awesome. Yep, good job. Um, so yeah, go ahead and keep doing it. We love, we love seeing that where you're logging in from where we're going to get the ball rolling. The process started. We, we know uh, we re respect and appreciate you've taken time from your likely very busy day to join us on today's vet girl YouTube live and excited to have Shelby here with us to do it, but let's get to some quick um, housekeeping as we move forward. For those of you that are joining us, maybe for the first time, if this is a familiar face or voice, that's me. My name is Garrett Pachtinger. Um, aside from Shelby being my better half, and I'm the worst half of the two, I'm also the co-founder of Vet Girl, and I'm a board-certified criticalist by trade. So really excited. I'll be behind the scenes helping to answer any questions you have. And please, if you do have questions, type them into that question screener. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> I also wanted to say, as many of you do know, when we've had the, the benefit, the fortune of an amazing educational partner such as Merck Animal Health, we're absolutely delighted to offer free race-approved CE to the veterinary world, the veterinary community. And so I did want to give a special shout out to Merck Animal Health. They've been an amazing educational partner with us for years. We love them, and we're excited that they are with us here today for this awesome, awesome session. And we're talking about dry eye, right? We are. We are. Though, you know what? It's going to be so good with so many laughs. I bet there won't be a dry eye in the house. <laughs> oh, I've been working on that for weeks. All right, <laughs> let's keep going. So as many of you do know, Vecril is the tech-savvy way to get your online veterinary continuing education, really at a very cost-effective price. If you're not a member yet, for $269 per year for a veterinarian, you get access to over 200 hours of new content every year, but complete access to our ever-growing on-demand library. So if you miss something, you can watch it at any time. With that said, it's a great opportunity to sign up as a team. Team memberships allow you to get your whole team involved to learn on the run with Vet Girl. You're all learning together at an even a more cost-effective price. It can be less than $120 a person, depending on how many people you sign up. So instead of $269, $120 or less is an amazing opportunity to learn with your entire team. Now, we're doing a... A, a mini webinar, a YouTube live today, but we do deliver CE in a multimedia approach. We love our audio podcasts, a great way to listen and learn whether you're 
walking the dog on the treadmill, commuting to work. It's a great way to get some education, really good clinically relevant, practical and unbiased CE, which is are, are the pillars that we, we love to be talking about and are founded on. And I would say our certificate program is another amazing value add to our platform. Currently, we have six different certificates that are live, basic and advanced emergency medicine, anesthesia, practice management, nutrition, and ophthalmology. So if you want to hear Dr. Reinstein talk more about you know, 30 hours worth of ophthalmology to really become more proficient in that area, check out our certificates. You all know as we're doing this broadcast live on YouTube, we love our social media. So whether you are liking us on Facebook, tweeting with us on Twitter, gramming with us, dancing with us on TikTok, or checking us out on YouTube. Just make sure you interact with us on social media. All right, couple last housekeeping slides. One, as we mentioned, this is live, this is interactive, this is race approved. How do you get your CE certificate? Well, you have two options. I'm gonna post this link in the chat as soon as I'm done giving my intro so you can copy and paste it, but the link so the form to fill out for your CE is right on this slide, or you can use your handy dandy smartphone and go to that QR code, which takes you right to that form. But I promise again, as soon as I'm done with my intro, I'll pop that website address, that URL into the screener so you can copy and paste it. I will leave this open for approximately 30 minutes after the session is over. So this is a 12 to 12.30 Eastern approximate session around one o'clock. I'll close it down, not before. So if you wanna watch and do it afterwards, no worries, just don't forget to do that. And again, I'll promise to post it in the question screener. As this is a YouTube live event, if you wanna make this more than just a tiny thumbnail on your screen, if you click it, I give you an arrow on your YouTube page, that broken box all the way to the right, it'll make this full screen on whatever device you are using. So again, you don't have that little pocket window to see through. And then lastly, if you've not yet registered for Vecural U, we're getting close to selling out. Make sure you sign up. This is the best boutique veterinary conference you will be at. Amazing lectures, amazing swag. It's going to be this August in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. It's great fun for the whole family. So if you've not yet signed up for Vecral U, I encourage you to do so pretty quickly so you don't have FOMO and miss out. All right. With that said, uh, I'm tired of talking. I'd like my better half to finish. We have <laughs> Dr. Shelby Ryan sign. I'm not going to give her intro. I always joke, at least my joke, and don't steal it. But whenever somebody else gives me an introduction before I lecture, it sounds more like an obituary than it actually <laughs> a, 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 an intro. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to get yelled at and sleep on the couch later tonight and get a bad intro. So Shelby, if you can give our audience a little bit of an intro of who you are, what you love doing, and then please take it away. The floor is going to be yours. Awesome. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you, everybody. I just want to point out that we had a hello from Kenya and a love from India, which is seriously the coolest thing ever. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm Dr. Shelby Reinstein. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist. Um, I live in the beautiful area of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm University of Pennsylvania trained. Um, and my passion is continuing education. Um, obviously, optho only. It's the only thing I'm good at are eyeballs. So we're going to fly through this today because I Garrett took seven minutes of my time. So per usual, I have to catch up. I'm a really, really fast speaker. So I'm going to fly through this stuff. If you guys want more information on dry eye, be sure to check out. I have a two hour webinar um, on the uh, the Vecro page. So jump on there and you can, you can get all of the good. So before we talk about dry eye, we have to talk about the tears and who they are and why they're there. The tear film is three main layers. The aqueous layer is that thick middle layer and it's produced by the lacrimal gland and the gland of the third eyelid. That's really the layer we're gonna be talking about today when we talk about eyes going dry. The lipid or oily layer is the surface layer produced by the meibomian glands, the little dudes that line our eyelids where we get styes. That helps to prevent the tear film from evaporating, super important surface layer. And then the innermost layer is the mucin layer and that's produced by the conjunctival goblet cells and that binds the whole tear film to the cornea to maintain that adherence. Now, my big soapbox is tears are not just water. They're not just lubrication. Obviously, one of the most important functions of tears is lubrication, mainly achieved by the aqueous layer, but the aqueous layer has a ton of nutrition in it. Think amino acids, glucose, oxygen. The cornea has got no blood vessels, guys. It has to get its nutrition from the tears. Super important as well as the antimicrobial properties. 
lysozyme, secretory IgA, all of that good stuff is in the tears, but also it forms a good barrier against the cornea. And then as you can imagine, when you get something stuck in your in your eye, you get a little eyelash or something, what happens? You tear and you blink. And that debris removal function is a super duper important function of the tears. So now that we know who the tears are and why they're so important, this is really what happens when things go wrong, right? So when a dog gets dry eye, there's a couple of different forms that I want you to know about. The most common form is what we call idiopathic KCS or keratoconjunctivitis zika. This is an immune mediated inflammation of that lacrimal gland and the gland of the third eyelid. What we see histologically, if anyone cares, is an increased number of T cells. And that kind of becomes important when we talk about treatment. But essentially what's happening is the glands are getting inflamed and they don't make our aqueous tears. So we get a low Schirmer tear test. This idiopathic KCS seen most commonly in middle-aged dogs, and it's almost always a bilateral disease. I won't say it's always symmetrical, but usually both eyes are affected to some degree. There's really nice studies looking at dogs who have dry eye. And what we know is there's a certain set of breeds who have an increased relative risk of developing idiopathic KCS over the other breeds. And those are, no, should be no shock, Bulldogs, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniels, Cocker Spaniels, Westies, Pugs, Shih Tzu, Lhasa, Apso. That's basically my appointment schedule every day, right? The other main cause of dogs getting dry eye that I want to sort of jump on a podium really quick is third eyelid gland removal or cherry eye, all right? So we know that the third eyelid gland contributes up to 40% of that aqueous tear. So that middle thick layer that's got all the good stuff in it, the third eyelid gland is making almost half of that. And what we know is if that gland pops out and we leave it out and cut it out, so we surgically excise it, almost half of those dogs are going to go on to develop dry eye. If we don't put it back, but we don't take it out. So we just leave a prolapsed gland sitting out. It's not much better. 43% of those dogs get dry eye. And even with perfect replacement of the gland, we can still see a small percentage more than sort of the general risk in the relative and, you know, general population of dogs. So soapbox is please, please, please put the cherry eyes back in sort of, you know, as quick as you can after they come out. Now, the last form of dry eye that I want to talk to you guys about is called neurogenic dry eye. And different than the idiopathic immune-mediated dry eye, this is a nerve problem. So you lose parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal gland. This is an idiopathic disease most often, but I will say that I see it a fair, um, a fair degree with otitis media and interna. You can see on the slide where I've put that sort of red X. What's happening is that's um, right near the tergopalatine junction. We're talking about near the bulla in the inner ear. And so anytime we have tikaboo issues, we have inner, um, otitis interna or otitis media, we absolutely can see that this nerve becomes affected and we develop neurogenic dry eye. As you can see where the red X is, that also normally affects the nasal nerve. And so the clinical key, your slam dunk to knowing whether a dog has neurogenic dry eye versus regular sort of, you know, standard immune mediated dry eye is that neurogenic dry eye is almost always unilateral with the other eye being completely normal. Look at Buttercup's left eye, it's goopy, it's nasty, it's vascularized. Her right eye looks perfect, shiny, crisp reflection. As well, the ipsilateral nostril, so the, the nose on the same side as the dry eye is also going to be dry. And that's again, because of where we lose that innervation. This form of dry eye is often acute and associated with ulceration. And if you wanna know more, definitely jump onto my dry eye webinar on, on uh, that girl, because I just simply don't have time to talk through everything about neurogenic dry eye today. Now, no matter what the cause of the decrease in aqueous tears is, whether it's the cutting out of a cherry eye, immune mediated or neurogenic, bad things happen, right? So if you have decreased aqueous tears, we will have frictional damage to the surface of the cornea. The cornea won't get good nutrition, good oxygen delivery. So we get corneal hypoxic damage. We don't have any tears to flush away debris. So we began to accumulate debris. And then of course, with all of those, we will get a bacterial overgrowth. We don't have our normal sort of innate immunity in the tears. We're not flushing debris. 
So we will inherently get a bacterial overgrowth. All of those things are going to cause sort of our classic um, set of conditions we see in dogs with dry eye. We get a conjunctivitis and then the cornea gets inflamed. So corneal vascularization, pigmentation, and fibrosis. Those three are sort of your hallmark findings of keratitis or an angry inflamed cornea. So put those together. We have keratitis, conjunctivitis, and the whole reason is because we're dry, which is where that Zika comes from. So not like you guys haven't seen this. What do we see clinically, right? These are all classic looking dogs with dry eyes. Almost always we have ocular discharge. And the, the word I like to use is sticky. It's the stuff that you can see it's smeared all over the cornea. It's not that little gray booger just in the inner medial canthus that's just hanging out. This stuff is goopy and everywhere. Squinting with dry eye is variable, and it depends on how long it took you to go dry. So if you are a bulldog and it took you two summers to, you know, battle through allergies and then finally you start to go dry and it's been three years since you've had dry eye, you're, you're probably not going to be squinting because you're used to it. Now, if you're a dog that has neurogenic dry eye and you lost your tears suddenly, your cornea is going to get super angry and you will definitely be more painful. So the discomfort is definitely related to the duration and sort of the speed of the development of KCS. The conjunctiva is going to get red and irritated and angry and swollen. And we will also potentially get corneal ulceration. Now, another quick soapbox. If you guys have a dog with dry eye that develops a corneal ulcer, you should automatically treat that dog way more aggressively than you would even if it's just a simple ulcer. Because remember, we have more bacteria on the surface of the eye than we normally do. We don't have the ability to fight it off because of our decreased immunity. And our cornea is probably super angry and at risk for worsening ulceration. So these dogs will oftentimes develop a rapid infection, corneal melting, and can even progress to perforation pretty quickly. So any ulcer in the face of dry eye should be treated very, very aggressively. How do we diagnose dry eye? Pretty simple. I'm sure you guys do this all day, every day with me, right? So it's the Schirmer tear test. We stick the little strip of paper in the ventral conjunctival fornix. We like to do this early in the exam, but obviously before we add any moisture to it. I get the question often, do you wipe out booger? Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. You don't want to stick this into a big glob of booger because what you need out of this is you need it to touch the surface of the eye. You need the dog to be able to feel that there's a strip of paper in the eye because part of what we're testing is the reflexive ability to produce tears in the face of irritation. So we should feel the strip of paper on the eye. You're going to leave it in for either a full minute or if it gets to 15 millimeters really quickly, like within, you know, 20, 30 seconds, you can take it out. That dog does not have dry eye. And you can just write 15 millimeters in 30 seconds. And you know that dog had great tear production. So you don't have to leave it in for a full minute. The normal values sort of that we go off of to classify the severity of KCS are on the slide. I sort of say, you know, we are the, either have almost no tears, mild or early. And the term early, um, I don't love because that makes us think that we don't have to be as aggressive in treatment early on when that's actually the opposite. I want you guys to be super aggressive with your treatment early on to not let things get to the severe point. The other diagnostic that I strongly recommend that you guys do with every case of dry eye is a fluorescein stain. A big, big uh, take home point that I always make sure you guys know is that you cannot diagnose or rule out a corneal ulcer without applying fluorescein stain and examining the eye with a cobalt blue filtered light. In this case specifically, but in all cases when performing a fluorescein stain, I would rinse the eye really, really well. You can use a lot of uh, sterile eye wash and flush out all the goop and the debris because you're not going to rinse away a corneal ulcer. That's why stain works the way it does. The epithelium of your cornea is hydrophobic, so everything washes right off. Same with Desmase membrane. That's why if you have a desmetaceal, that bottom portion doesn't stain. But any stroma that is exposed, which technically by definition is what an ulcer is, right? stromal exposure, 
you're going to have stain and it's going to stick and you're not going to be able to rinse it off. You're going to, it's going to stay there for, you know, a couple of hours at least. So with all the goop and nastiness that's normally on the surface of a dog with dry eye, make sure you rinse really thoroughly before you examine for ulceration. All right, the rest of the time we're going to talk about how to treat these dogs because that's really what we all care about, right? So I will tell you guys, take home point is that no patient that is diagnosed with dry eye is going to walk out on a single eye drop. It just doesn't happen. There's not one eye drop that gives us everything that we need to do for our patients, especially early on. And I make sure that owners understand that we have a lot of things happening right now, right? We're dry, so we need more tears, but we also have bacterial overgrowth. That's what all the green gunk is. We need to get that under control. We're super inflamed, that red puffy membrane. There's not anything that we can do that's going to cover all of those things, right? So almost always the initial therapy for dogs with dry eye is going to be a combination protocol of a tear stimulant, an antibiotic, an anti-inflammatory, and a tear substitute. Now we'll talk about each of these categories um, individually. So when we talk about tear stimulants, these when we the class of drug are T cell modulators. And that's why I sort of harped on the, you know, the origin of dry eye and the the pathogenesis behind it is that we have an increased number of CD8 positive T cells in our glandular tissue. And so if we can reduce the number of T cells, reduce the glandular inflammation, then that gland is going to be able to do its thing and give us some tears and we will get an increase in our Schirmer tear test. But the cool thing about these drugs, the T-cell modulators, is that we're not just treating glandular inflammation. They have a very, very, very nice effect on the surface inflammation that we talked about, the keratoconjunctivitis, which really is going to also help to improve that patient comfort early on. Now, our two tear stimulants that we have available as T-cell modulators are cyclosporin and tacrolimus. Cyclosporin is available commercially, um, Optimune 0.2% ointment made by our friends over at Merck. We thank them again for their generous sponsorship of this. So Optimune ointment is probably the most common initial choice and approximately 80% of dogs are gonna respond to that medication. We can also have it compounded. Um, normal percentages, probably the most commonly used, are 1% and 2% drops. We can make this in a lot of various oils, an aqueous base, or even into an ointment if we need to. Tacrolimus is another T cell modulator available. Um, it is compounded only, right? So you're going to have to reach out to, you know, one of your, I like the larger compounding pharmacies, make sure that we understand our shelf lives um, and all of that important stuff that goes into compounding. Tacro, you can make into also pretty much anything you want, oil-based drops, aqueous-based drops, ointment, I would say that the 0.02 and 0.03 percentages are most common to start off with, but we can go pretty high with tacrolimus as well, um, you know, 0.5 or even 1%, which is very, very strong. Tacrolimus has a similar initial response rate to the cyclosporin, which is why we generally say start with Optimune. However, there was one study that did show that about a quarter of dogs that are doing well on cyclosporin may actually improve more with the addition of tacrolimus. And so I'll talk about using a combination protocol of both drugs um, as a potential for some severe cases of dry eye. And about 50% of dogs who did not respond to cyclosporin, so remember an 80% response rate, so we have 20% of dogs that are not going to respond to cyclosporin, about half of those dogs will respond to tacrolimus. So definitely something to consider if you've used um, cyclosporin appropriately at the right concentration, the right um, frequency, and the right duration, and you feel that that patient could get better, you may want to think about Tacro. Now, so cyclosporin and tacrolimus, um, again, I want you guys to start these drugs early. These are the mainstay of therapy. They are treating the underlying cause of the disease. My um, you know, best analogy that is, that is non-op there related, I was telling this to Garrett the other day, treating dry eye with just lube and seeing how they do <coughs> is like treating a dog with IMHA with just blood and seeing how they do.
right? If we don't give them steroids and stop the inflammation that's causing the anemia, or in the case of, of what I'm talking about, the dry eye, we aren't going to get better and we're going to continue to get worse. We may clinically seem a little bit better for a while, but we are absolutely not doing that patient justice. So start these drugs early. And I usually start with twice to three times a day to start with, because we can always reduce over time our frequency to find the lowest effective. But I like doing it that way rather than starting with twice a day and going, eh, we're not better after three months and saying, oh, let's try three times a day. Let's just get them controlled as quickly as we can. We will see an improvement in the Shermer tear test within two to four weeks of starting this drug, but we're not going to get a full effect for even four months. So as long as you guys are seeing improvement at the sort of one month recheck that I generally recommend, we don't say, oh, but we're not normal yet. We should do something else. Just keep going. As long as we're getting better, it's going to take a little while for things to get perfect. So stick with it. I usually do not recommend going lower than once a day. Um, when we talk about um, using T cell modulators, there are some studies that show that tear production falls pretty quickly after 24 hours of the last dose. So let's not reduce it any more than once a day. And again, combination cyclosporin tacrolimus is definitely something to keep in your back pocket for dogs that are non-responders or super severe. Now, I talked about neurogenic dry eye. We will use cyclosporin and tacrolimus to help treat the surface inflammation in these patients. But remember, their lacrimal gland is not inflamed. It's just not getting the neurologic signal. And so our tear stimulant, by the true definition, for a dog with neurogenic KCS is going to be pilocarpine. And again, I wish I had two hours to talk to YouTube live for you guys, but I don't. So there are both topical and oral protocols for using pilocarpine, and it is definitely something that you're going to want to do your research on. So watch my lecture on dry eye, the two hour one, and you'll get everything you need to know. Moral of the story is we need to use tear stimulants early on in the disease because we need to start making real tears because there's absolutely nothing better than your own real tears. Now, the other category that we need to focus on is our antibiotics and anti-inflammatory, right? I said that there is bacterial overgrowth that needs to be treated. We see this on the slides that ocular discharge is full of bacteria. The conjunctivitis is being caused a lot, a lot of times by this bacterial overgrowth. We can use broad spectrum topical antibiotics. That's my preference. So we're looking at two to three times a day, something like Neopolygram, Neopolybac, Cipro, Genomycin. Those are all appropriate choices for dogs with sort of run-of-the-mill dry eye, not ulcers. Remember, we're not talking about dogs with ulcers, but just run-of-the-mill dry eye with bacterial overgrowth. Those are appropriate antibiotics. We also need to treat the inflammation, right? That's the keratoconjunctivitis. So let's treat the keratitis, the conjunctivitis, the blepharitis. And my preference um, to do that is topical steroids. We can use them one, two, or really three or four times a day, um, depending on the severity of the inflammation. My preference is dexamethasone in this case over pred acetate. And that's because dexamethasone technically is more powerful than pred but it doesn't penetrate into the eye. And that's great because we don't need it to do so in this case. We are not treating uveitis. We do not need steroid concentrations in our anterior chamber. We just need them on the surface of the eye. And so dexamethasone is an awesome um, option in this case. Now, I hope I don't have to say it, but please, please, please make sure you're doing your fluorescein stains and that you are fluorescein negative before you prescribe topical steroids. The... Um, one thing I did want to mention to you guys is that Jenison Durafilm, made by our, our friends at Merck, is back on the market and is an awesome option um, to combine medications and improve our client compliance. It's hard to give dogs eye medications. And so if we have something that can deliver two drugs um, and sort of cover two of our categories out of this multi-drug protocol, it's always very handy. So Jenison Durafilm, um, has genomycin in it, beta methasone. So we've got our antibiotic, we've got our steroid, and these drugs are suspended in an aqueous colloidal solution with what they call durafilm, which is basically just a really thin, quickly spreading film that spreads and stays um, on the surface of the eye to increase contact time of the drug. 
So contact your Merck rep because it's an awesome option that um, is back. It was off the market for a long time and, and it's back and available. Neopolydex also does the same thing. So again, neomycin polymyxin B being both antibiotics and dexamethasone uh, being our great steroid. So we can get those delivered either by a suspension or an ointment and kill two birds with those as well. And lastly, we have to give them moisture. That is what they need in the early phases, right? These dogs are dry. And so just some moisture is going to improve comfort. It's going to reduce frictional damage to the cornea um, and will probably let them take their other eye drops better. So tear stimulants, you guys remember, are not effective immediately. We're waiting one, two or three or even four months to see how we're going to respond to these tear stimulants, your cyclosporin and your tacrolimus. And so until we are producing better tears, we need to give them moisture. We're going to use these really as often as you need. Um, three to four times a day is usually where I start. Uh, most importantly, these are usually thicker. And so we want to use them last in the sequence of things if we're using drops waiting five minutes between. And it's really beneficial, honestly, to keep jogs with dry eye on tear substitutes long-term. So these guys love it to get a blob of their gel um, nightly before bed or before they go to the shore or before they go to the dog park or out walking, wherever it may be, these guys are always at risk of having a reduced tear production. So more lube, the better. I definitely prefer um, tear substitutes that are in the gel formulation or what they call a viscous drop sometimes. We have lots of options that are veterinary specific and that most of them now contain hyaluronic acid, which does awesome things for the cornea. So we have things like Optics Care Eye Lube Plus in the purple tube that has hyaluronic acid in it and is probably the product that I use most often as a tear substitute. But there's other ones on the market. Eye Drop has two different ones for moderate to severe dry eye. Um, I tend to use these sorts of gel or viscous drops um, over the use of ointments or solutions for lubricant purposes. I think ointments sort of goop everything up um, in addition to the other ointments that may be going on and solutions don't tend to last as long. So reach out for a gel or a viscous drop um, in, these, in, in these situations. <sighs> and with that, it is on the nose 1230. So I feel like I can't be yelled at by Garrett for going over. <laughs> thank you guys so, so much. Um, thank you to Merck uh, for having me here. And obviously thank you for Vet Girl for continuing to have me yak at you guys about eyeballs. So I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys soon. I'm sure I can find a reason to <laughs> either yell at you or get yelled at, one of the <laughs> two. But um, Shelby, uh, Dr. Reinstein, officially, thank you so much. I mean, really awesome information. A lot of great comments. Please go ahead and type in any comments, praise, questions, et cetera, in the questions screener. Um, I did just want to briefly, two things. One is go back to this slide here. So remember, here we go, right? Did I get it? There we go, right there. Um, to fill out that URL and or use that QR code to fill out your form. I'll leave this open for approximately another 30 minutes. If you uh, uh, have questions and don't want to get uh, off the webinar yet, uh, please make sure you do that in the next half an hour by 1 p.m. Eastern. And also want to again thank Merck Animal Health for their, uh, they are an amazing educational partner. We always appreciate their support to provide this race approved CE free to the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health. And with that said, I'd love to get to a, a couple of questions. The first question that I wanted to ask is um, somebody asked, uh, are there cases where there may be an ambiguously low Shermer tier and you're like, I don't really know if this is case yes, or could there be another reason? Uh, I'm just going to throw out words that I know relate to eyes, uveitis, glaucoma, corneal ulceration. You see all those terms and phrases? Yes. Are, the point being, are there other reasons that your tier production, your, your Shermer tier test may be low and you're questioning whether or not this is true case yes? Yes. And I'll throw um, a, a term that you should know, um, stress. So again, sympathetic tone, right? So it's, this is why I like almost never do Shermer tear test in cats. Like find me a cat that's just like chilling on the exam table with a piece of paper in its eye, right? They're freaking out. And there's dogs absolutely that will have such a high sympathetic tone that they'll have a reduced Shermer tear test. Now, again, in those cases, you have to look to the cornea. Is, the cor is there, you know, absolute evidence of conjunctivitis? Are there blood vessels in the cornea? Is there 
other evidence that this dog's tears are low. Because if they just fell right now, you're not going to have any symptoms or any other findings on the eye. If the dog is presenting to you for a couple of days worth of rubbing and scratching and discharge of its eyes and you do a Shermer and you're getting a low number, there is no harm in starting medications. We can always stop the medications in the future if you're wrong, but I'd rather do that than wait and let their eyes go more dry and let them get an ulcer. And then we have much bigger fish to fry. Thank you. Um, you commented when you talked about preparation, compounded preparation or other preparations as an oil, there's an aqueous. Do you have a preferred, um, are there drugs that you like in the oil form versus the aqueous form and yeah. vice versa? So I will tell you, you know, obviously Optimune 0.2% ointment, keep that on your shelf. If you need to compound cyclosporin, I would say the most common is going to be 1% in corn oil. Contraindications to using an oil base for me are super fuzzy smush face guys, which is like a lot of my population of patients. But we find that the oil gets down into the medial canthus, into the nasal folds, and it doesn't evaporate as well as, let's say, an aqueous base or maybe an ointment that doesn't spill and run down there because those dogs will get terrible nasal fold derm disease and they you know, will smell worse than they already do. Um, tacrolimus, I would say, um, I almost always use 0.03% aqueous. Um, I find that the drug stays you know, suspended better um, than cyclosporin in an aqueous form. You're going to have to shake it to disperse it because these are oil or fat soluble drugs. Um, but those would be the most common um, oil and, and water-based drugs that I use. Awesome. Um, another question that came through, have you seen cases of transient KCS, yes, transient dry eye, secondary to other disease? Oh, I think we just lost Shelby. Give me one quick second. Well, here's what happens when you have technology <laughs> issues on two computers. You end up just telling her to come downstairs. Now, this would be I much, didn't touch anything. I this swear. would be much harder with a speaker that is not at my house right now. So benefits of her being here are saying, yelling, come downstairs. Let's continue. So as we were saying, have, you, have we seen cases of transient dry eye secondary to other disease? Yeah, I think there are some really nice reports actually probably in JVEC um, talking about dogs with systemic illness and sort of a secondary transient um, sort of diffuse systemic inflam inflammation that can cause, again, enough stress, enough increase in sympathetic tone, um, and not truly be the idiopathic immune-mediated T-cell infiltration of, of the lacrimal gland. Now, again, we know that there are lots of other reasons for dogs to get dry. We didn't talk about sulfas. We didn't talk about radiation therapy. We didn't talk about lacrimal gland aplasia, like in Yorkie puppies. So these are not the only reasons that dogs go dry, but if you ask me to name the top three reasons that I I see dogs that have a low Schirmer tear test. It's going to be your immune mediated dry eye, number one, two, three, and four. Then we're going to have cherry eye removal um, and neurogenic dry eye. So those are kind of the big ones I wanted to, to touch on. Another great question that came through. Um, I don't know that you can all read it for some reason. It got cut off on the screen. But the question was, can you still use cyclosporin or tacrolimus if you have a, an ulcer secondary to your KCS? Yeah. So... Yes, is the answer. Um, I would potentially start off maybe twice a day and not three times a day, depending on how dry that dog is. But I usually, I will still start it. I will definitely not use any topical steroids. So that kind of becomes our only anti-inflammatory topically um, in that situation. But then remember, you're going to be being much more aggressive with topical antibiotics. You're going to be using potentially serum. We're going to talk about oral antibiotics, potentially oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to help with that inflammation. So I wouldn't choose the most powerful, you know, 1% tacrolimus and start it six times a day if you have an ulcer, because you're going to increase the risk of an inf a bacterial infection taking place. You just really need to be much more aggressive with your antibiotic and oral medications, your topical and, and oral medications um, when you do have an ulcer. So I, I saw some, there was a question 
what anti-inflammatory do you use if you do have an ulcer? Um, and that's going to switch to oral because remember, that's going to help with a lot of the pain of the conjunctivitis and the blepharitis and the reflexive ciliary spasm that these dogs get. But then cyclo and tacro topically will help somewhat treat the keratoconjunctivitis. And hopefully with that lube and a, a ton of really aggressive antibiotic therapy, you'll, you'll get that going in the right direction. And we'll finish up with one final question. Again, I wanted to thank everyone for taking their time. I'm sure you have an incredibly busy caseload and day. We know that has not led up. So we really appreciate um, you spending uh, uh, your, your time with us. But we'll finish with one final question here. Have you seen cases um, where there, and I'm just going to throw out something that was written like a, a, an eyelid mass, something that could cause some irritation and inflammation. I'll oh, we'll get to one more question after this. Thank you for that. Um, but like an eyelid mass or something where like, oh, I think this dog probably has case yes, but is there something that could be stimulating or even if there's a mass there that's causing such bad inflammation and irritation if the tear gland is shot and can't do anymore, you're like, you're not going to stimulate any more than that's that than the, that is already there. Yeah, I think that's one of the big take home points is that the longer the lacrimal gland and the gland of the third eyelid are inflamed, the less likely you will be able to stimulate them to the point of getting a normal tear production because that gland, the inflamed gland is going to turn to scarred gland and scarred gland can't make tears. And so that's why I get super bummed when I have these bulldogs, you know, six year old bulldogs that have come in, they've been on Neopolydex or, you know, whatever for four years to treat their allergic inflammation and now they've gone blind because their cornea is pigmented and there's no way I'm getting those tears to make anything. So then it's just a matter of, of comfort and sort of, you know, quality of life. And so if that dog was properly diagnosed and started on, you know, cyclosporin or, or tacrolimus four years ago, we potentially wouldn't be in that situation. So start your tear stimulants early. Um, and so don't sort of just allow things to, you know, here we go, because again, we will get to the point where we, we can't do anything about it. And we will get to, as promised, last question, but yep. it's a great question. So you commented that um, the new Jenison Durafilm is back on the market. And uh, I think that we had a couple questions that come in that piqued interest. Yeah. So obviously we talked about it in relation to the talk today on KCS, but what other indications? So why should we carry that on our shelves? Can that uh, be beneficial for us in other disease processes or cases that and, and how would you use that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a couple of, of good things about this, this drug. So kind of think about it as neopolydex. So if you have a dog with um, allergic conjunctivitis, just, uh, you know, not because of dry eye, it's a puppy um, first time hanging out at the dog park and it gets that sort of follicular allergic conjunctivitis. This is a great way to deliver prophylactic antibiotics to get rid of the bacterial overgrowth and a topical steroid to control that inflammation. So kind of think about anything that you would use neopolydex for um, and you can, you can transition this. So dogs with panis that you're trying to get under control and let your tacrolimus start to work, for example. So another disease that we use these same drugs for. Um, the other good thing is, um, you know, it is something that has the durafilm in it. So we do have an increased contact time. Um, and so patients that potentially are a little bit more difficult to treat and you really want a three times a day drug um, dosing, but they maybe can't get that, perhaps choosing this and doing it twice a day with that increased contact time, you might be able to get a similar um, clinical result. So think about anything you'd use Neopolydex for in a dog and, and you can pretty much use Genesis and Durafilm for that. Awesome. Well, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate, again, all of your time. It's really um, quite fulfilling and cool to see people from veterinary professionals from all over the world um, log in, join us, um, learn, hopefully have a little bit of fun. And um, we're happy for that. Again, please don't forget to fill out your CE form. Uh, please also don't forget our Vet Girl U 2022 conference this August in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area is coming up quickly and seats are filling up quickly. So if you have interest, you and your team members, as I said before, it's the coolest boutique conference you will be at. Lots of amazing swag, amazing lecturers uh, will be there. Dr. Ryan Stein is gonna be there as well as myself, Justine, and some of our amazing uh, uh, colleagues and teammates. So please go ahead and check that out on our website. Um, you should get your CE certificate, uh, hopefully within the next couple of days, we're just gonna verify attendance. So please make sure you fill out that form. Hope, hope many of you, if not all of you, have a great rest of your day. It's not too terrible. And uh, we will see you online at our next Vet Girl event. So have a great day, great week. And summer's Thank coming. You. We'll see you soon.